Yes, it's a pleasure that we have two amazing speakers today, and we are going to discuss the semantic search, why is it so important and how to do it properly. And uh, I have a pleasure to welcome Andrei Vasnetsov and Nils Reimers, who are going to be our speakers today. Andrei is a co-founder of Quadrant and the, uh, the core co contributor to Quadrant uh, Vector Database. Um, Andrei, would you like to share something about Quadrant, what you do and... Uh, sure. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Kasper. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Andrei. I'm a CTO at Quadrant, basically the first contributor for first open source maintainer of the of the engine. Uh, I started it basically as a pet project, and now uh, I find out that I am not the only one who have the same kind of issues with vector search uh, and. Uh, <laughs> Since then, we, we created a company uh, around this project and yeah, now growing it and trying to deliver best features in the industry. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, we are hoping for some great project uh, created during this hackathon. And another speaker, Niels Reimers, who is currently the director and principal scientist uh, of machine learning at Cohere. Uh, Niels, would you like to share something about what you do at Cohere? also about your background. Oh yeah, so, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm quite a big fan of semantic search. I uh, started to work on it for quite a long time ago, like five years ago. Uh, first from a research perspective, really understanding how can you train these models. Um, so, so when I started, it was like no code for available and also like vector DB support was like really limited. And then really aiming how, how can you train machine learning model at that time BERT came out and how can you train like a transformer model to do like semantic search it was like really enjoyable ride since then um, really has been so far mainly focusing on the models so how can you make the models better to really understand your meaning and really try to to give you the best results and I'm super happy to have like amazing partner like Quadrant uh, focusing on more of the technical technicalities of a vector database uh, where I don't have like any expertise. So I know how to train machine learning models and create these vector spaces. And you guys, you really know how to index it efficiently and run it nicely. Uh, so, so you're like really the experts on the low level stuff. And I think it's implemented in Rust. And I'm more like Python high level and anything that's below Python is like too, too deep of my knowledge. But yeah, I, I know how to create the vector spaces. And yeah, really, really excited about multilingual, cross-lingual search. Um, so far, multilingual search, if you do it on a keyword level, was always painful. So, so you have a lot of support for English, but I'm German. So, so if we deploy like a German system, you have to transfer everything to German. And it's still easy in German, but because luckily Germans came off the great idea to invent like white or use white spaces between tokens. But then when your boss asks you, hey, also deploy the system for Japanese, you say, wow, why should I deploy it for Japanese? There are like no white spaces. There are like three different ways how you can tokenize Japanese text, uh, like really unclear what I like the semantics to you tokenize on semantics, do you tokenize on syntax, do you tokenize on, on character level? And so, so it was always really, really painful. And yeah, with semantic search, it's it's a lot easier. So, so I would say it's 100 times easier to do multilingual search in a vector space. Uh, you can use the same system once you have set it up for any language, which is amazing. And one use case which which is really interesting that pops up now is like cross-lingual search. So, so you take on like a German query and you search for Chinese documents or Japanese documents, which people have not thought about this before because in keyword search, if I plug in like an Arabic search query on a Chinese document collection, I will not find like any, any documents. But now people find like more and more cool, interesting use cases for this because sometimes you don't know where's the, the information. So, so we see like, I don't know, the SVB bank run over the weekend to unfold. And maybe there were some early warning signs in, I don't know, in German or in Arabic or in Chinese. So maybe there was like someone in Japan tweeting about this, posting about this, where you could predict, okay, yeah, the, the bank will go down and will melt. And if you get this information early on, it's super helpful for you. So, so really excited about the community, what 
cool use cases they will pick up in multi and cross-lingual search. Great, thank you, Niels. Yeah, it's also worth mentioning that uh, majority of semantic search applications typically rely on something that Niels has created, because he's also the author of the most popular libraries in that area. But you already brought the, the that topic to the table. I wanted to ask you if you could just describe to those who are not really familiar with the concepts behind the vector search how it is uh, how how the how the how it works uh, comparing to the to the traditional keyword based search and what does what are the advantages and advantages over that uh, old methods? Yeah, happy to start, and then. And Ray, you can take on and, and talk from a database perspective why we need special vector databases for this. And I can't do this in my MySQL database, for example, or Elasticsearch. Um, so, so semantic search, the idea is to is based on vector spaces. So um, words are nice for us humans to understand them, but it's like really hard for a computer to understand the relationship between words. So, so you as a human, if you see the word hotel and motel, you know, okay, what's the relationship? Both is like a building where you can stay overnight, where you have a bed and a room. Uh, but for a computer, it's really hard to say what's the connection between these two words. Just some bytes that have no. And semantic search, you start to, to bring the meaning we have in language to a format that's understandable for the computer which are vector spaces. So, so you create these high dimensional vector space and you map every first every word and then every sentence into the vector space such that you have certain mathematical patterns in the vector space so that you know, okay, these two concepts, hotel and motel, they are really close or cat and dog. You have both describing animals and people love cats and dogs and often they live together with humans. So, so you bring all this in a vector space so that the computer can easily reason about like distances, angles, um, areas in the vector space. And you really map the understanding of the human text and words to, to a representation um, that's well understood by the computer. And yeah, for, for multilingual search, um, because you go away from these keywords, you go to like meanings and the meaning doesn't matter on the language. So, so if you describe like a cat or in German a katze or in Spanish a gato or in I don't know French or Japanese or Chinese, it's like it's a cat. So so here's the cat. It doesn't matter which characters you're using for the cat, it's a cat. And Chinese cat has the same properties probably as the German cat or as the UK cat. Um, so, so it doesn't matter. And this makes it so easy to do like this semantic search because it's not narrowed down in like words, which are like dependent on the language, but it's narrowed down in the semantics, which are a lot more stable across languages. That's on the one side, not much nicer if the computer understands what you mean, so it can get you much better results. So it understands if you're with Apple, um, the, the fruit apple or the company apple. So when I asked like who founded apple, it knows, yeah, probably no one invented the fruit apple, but someone created the company apple. So it knows where do I have to look in the vector space and find the right information about the founders of apple. Yeah, and we need special vector databases for this and there. Pass it over to Andrew uh, to talk about more on this. Yeah, sure. So uh, from from perspective of uh, low level implementations, I guess the main difference between uh, vector search and regular keyword search is the representation of, of data. Uh, in case of uh, traditional approaches where you have a document and a bunch of keywords, your document is so-called a sparse vector, where each element of vector corresponds to some word and uh, the length of the vector is basically the length of your vocabulary and vocabulary could be really huge uh, like it's it's up to up to several millions of tokens uh, and uh, uh, only a small fraction of those tokens are pre actually present in a document for uh, semantic search and for uh, vector embeddings it's a totally different story uh, instead of large a sparse vector, you have a relatively small but very dense representation of the document. Uh, 
usually it's about uh, 500 uh, float point numbers. And in order to search through these uh, vectors, and in order to perform uh, similarity computation, you need, uh, first of all, completely different type of index, and second of all, completely different type of operations that you can do on it. Uh, of course, there are already uh, existing uh, solutions, existing algorithms, which are designed to perform this type of uh, indexing, perform this type of search, but uh, those are, again, very different from uh, what you expect from, from traditional search, where you can efficiently keep all uh, keywords on disk uh, and where you can efficiently um, much uh, like different uh, queries uh, with document in vector search is, is a bit more complicated. Uh, all algorithms are um, expect uh, expect random access uh, to to all the data you have. And in semantic search, uh, I guess the main uh, problem with it is that each document is somewhat similar to any other document in your collection. It might be a bit uh, similar, like a small uh, correlation, but in the end, you can compare any document with any other document. That's why uh, you cannot really uh, do very efficient uh, on disk storage for this type of systems. So uh, yeah, Quadrant <laughs> is especially focused on dense vectors, and uh, we are building our system around it, and we uh, like the dense vectors is a first uh, first order citizen in, in our database, and that's why it, it might be efficient in doing the same things in in MySQL or Elasticsearch. Great, but do you think that we don't need this keyword based search anymore, or is it something that is uh, that might be that might co coexist with uh, semantic search as well? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, of course, there are uh, some applications which uh, works better with uh, traditional search. For example, if you know some very specific term uh, and you are looking for this specific term, it's always better to use keywords because in this case, like uh, dense representation is, uh, is not that exact in terms of it can sometimes uh, lose information about your your document. Uh, it's like lose, lose the compression of document into vector space. Uh, that's why, yeah, sometimes sometimes uh, exact search by terms is, is preferable. But uh, since uh, we are talking about multilingual, it's uh, getting more and more complicated to do so. Uh, you either need to basically have a copy of, of a document uh, on, on each language you want to search for, or you need to make a huge li list of uh, synonyms in order to be able to find something in, in multilingual collection. And that's very expensive for traditional search. It doesn't scale at all. And yeah, each uh, new language will basically duplicate the whole uh, set of documents you have. or it will slow down your search if you're going into synonyms. Yes, so, so keyword search is just really good if you want to do like keyword search. So, so if you have like a specific error code, which is some random number you know, in your log files, um, yeah, obviously keyword search is the best and most efficient because there's like also usually not a lot of meaning in random numbers for error codes. Also in phone numbers, there's not that much meaning in it. Um, their keyword search is like unmatched. And then based on your application, you need to see, do, do you want to do keyword search? So I don't know, maybe you search through log files and want to find specific error codes. Then keyword search is the best one. But in many other settings, people want answers and you see more and more <coughs> shift in behavior going away from keyword search, asking, for example, Google like, I don't know how's the weather in Toronto or uh, when is the sunset in Australia, stuff like that. So some more asking network questions as it appear 
and not trying to guess what's the keyword in the answer you're looking for. Yep. And there, semantic search is, is much better. So usually the good practice is to combine both of them. If you uh, need to search for a specific uh, term in, uh, in your collection, uh, and on top of this uh, match by keyword, you also want to do some semantics, then you can use a, a full text filtering in Quadrat, it's provided. So uh, the result you would get is that you will only search through those documents which contain required term, and it will also be um, ranked by, by semantic similarity of the vector. So it's like a, a solution in between, which can, in some cases, uh, provide you uh, a reasonable, reasonable performance. But of course, if you want to go even deeper, if you have a very specific uh, uh, requirements in your system, if you want to implement, for example, search as you type system, uh, where it's uh, important to show results even when a, a user only typed like two characters, in this case, vector search is not really efficient. You cannot really extract meaning uh, from, from two characters. In this case, it's, uh, there are other systems which are more suitable, and you can use vector search as a like a next step of the search or a combination and, and then do the scoring after, after retrieval. Great. So hybrid is possible, and that's, uh, yes. that's probably the, the future of search. I also agree with that. Uh, and since we are talking about the future, uh, I know that serverless is thought to be the future of the web development. And right now, uh, some people um, have some troubles with differentiating between vector uh, libraries and vector databases. But but those are like two different uh, two different options. And and uh, vector databases are designed to support real life, real uh, life systems, while vector libraries are. Uh, rather for some quick experiments. But my question is about uh, what, do, what do you think, how we are going to, to uh, provide the vector search capabilities in the future? Do you think that serverless is uh, one of the options possible? Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, there are two main, uh, like big, heavy components in uh, search systems. Uh, the, the first is uh, encoders models, neural networks, and the second is uh, storage itself. It has very different scaling pattern. It has very different approach uh, for, for deployment. So uh, in my opinion, it doesn't really make sense to combine those two in some kind of um, single uh, engine, because in this case, you would, be, you would have a hard time scaling it up in case you have your maintaining some uh, some system which required to handle high low. So, uh, and th at the same time, uh, you need a, a short uh, uh, glue code to combine the results of, of both of them. So to combine uh, uh, results of vector encoders and uh, pass it uh, through search um, in the database and then uh, somehow combine it back into 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 the output for the user. And actually, there are a lot of different scenarios uh, which uh, could be potentially implemented in this case. So uh, you can uh, query a database in many different uh, uh, ways. You can um, pre-process text for embeddings in many different uh, ways as well and uh, you also can apply a, a third model on top of it for example if you if you want to get advantage of uh, generative models you can also apply uh, this type of model on top to rescore or somehow transform the search result and uh, there are a lot of possibilities how can you do it so for that uh, you probably might want to have some piece of code and the question is yeah where where to store this code and how to execute it uh, it could either be some some machine and that's i guess where most people have problems so they do not want to host this machine 
uh, or you can probably put it in some kind of yeah, framework somewhere. Yeah, I'm a big, big fan of serverless. Um, so, so as a web developer, so, so my career background is in web development. It's like never pleasant to take care of the management of the infrastructure. How do you scale it? Um, and then even if you deploy like a small system, it's it's kind of like a challenge to, to say, OK, I spin up like these expensive machines and then use it. <clears throat> Um, yeah, for semantic search, as Andrew said, it's two components on the model side. So that's that's my nice thing about the, the Cohere API. It's pay per usage. So um, if you train your own model, you have to put your own model on a GPU, which makes it kind of expensive for many settings because you pay like thousands of dollars per month for this GPU, which is idle most of the time. So, so if you have like 10 queries a day, 100 queries a day, even if you have like 10,000 queries of a day and GPU is like idle all the time, uh, which is like really wasteful in terms of resources. So, so that's the nice thing if you use it with an API provider, like an embedding provider like Cohere, because people can share the resources, which make it a lot e cheaper for, for you individually. Bigger challenge is on the vector database side. So, so you're always happy to see vector databases to um, innovate because it's kind of a challenge. You have this vector database, which is maybe one gigabyte, 10 gigabyte, 100 gigabytes in size, and you want to access like all the points quickly, so you need to keep it in memory. So this makes it, I still think, so far challenging from the vector database to really scale to zero and say, okay, if you have like, I don't know, 10 queries a day, it will cost you a cent. I don't know if you have like good ideas how you can do like scale to zero from a vector database size. Well, another challenge in, in databases is that uh, you actually need to know where your data is located. If if you just have a, a model, uh, you you do not care like in which region it executes. It's stateless, and you can uh, do computation in basically closest closest to your machine available. In case of databases, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, you cannot have your data everywhere. Uh, and you have to choose uh, wisely where where your users are are going to make requests from which region. So uh, yeah, again, uh, for for databases, is of course a bigger challenge. Uh, another challenge is that um, it's not like with uh, with um, current uh, uh, indexes which we have. It's all about uh, memory. Uh, it's it's not about compute that much, but it's about memory, and you, you need to store everything in memory if you really want a high performance. Otherwise, it's of course possible to uh, completely separate compute from storage and store index on, let's say, AWS S3 and compute uh, somehow put in AWS Lambda, but in this case, you will wait for, for a second uh, before your request is executed. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, that's definitely a, a challenge, but there are also some other challenges that, that people working with uh, vector embeddings need to solve, and sometimes it is also related to the neural models they use. Well. Actually, if we just create a, a, any kind of network and set the weights randomly, they could provide us some sort of embeddings. Uh, and I'm not talk even talking about this kind of scenario, but how would you approach the uh, embeddings quality and, and the control of them? Are there any uh, ways of how to recognize that the embeddings that we use are just uh, not that accurate? Yes. Yeah, so. Um... Sadly, it's not so easy that you just um, train the, this, like the, the weights in your transformer network or neural network randomly, um, because then you will not capture like these semantics, like how is cat, dog, and human like connected. Um, sadly, it's also not sufficient just to take like a pre-trained word model, which was trained with like mass language modeling. So it's, it's produced like really bad, bad vector space. Um, 
for training these models, what you need is typically like pairs. So where you say, okay, these are like two things you want to have like close in the lecture space. This can be like a question answer pair where you say, okay, this, this is a question and this is like the answer to that question. But can also be from other sources like an e-commerce, you say, okay, that's, that's a search query and that's like the product that's been bought in my store. Um, or in, in uh, scientific papers, you say, okay, that's, that's a paper and this paper is citing some other paper. You say, okay, if two papers are citing each other, they are similar and I want you to have them close in the vector space. Um, and yeah, you, you need a lot of these pairs because it's the, the models, so that, that's kind of like a disadvantage of semantic search. They try to, to um, derive the meaning of words, and they also try to derive the meanings of words they don't know. So in keyword search, the system doesn't know what a word means. So it doesn't know what a skewed in, it just sees, okay, it's like a five character word. And if you search for it, I will pull up all the articles with skewed in, in it. Uh, but yeah, in semantic search, the, the model really tries to understand, okay, what is it? And in this context, it means a vector database. So I have to map it in the vector space for the vector database. So you, it's kind of like data intensive. To get like a really good model, you need kind of a lot of training data. So, so at Cohere, we have like roughly 2 billion training pairs of question and answers from these hundreds of languages. And yeah, and then train the model on this. So, so really capture what well, we try to capture all the nuances and also try to capture like new things, new companies, new products, uh, new developments and events that happen in the world to be well represented in the vector space. Yeah, from, from my perspective, there is uh, another uh, thing that uh, sometimes if uh, your query doesn't match uh, with uh, anything, in your collection, if it gives you a very uh, low score of similarity, it doesn't yet mean that your query is bad. It might be that just you do not have anything relevant in your database. So it might be, uh, in some specific cases, it might be useful to have examples of garbage in, in your, in your uh, collection just to distinguish garbage queries. If, if they go into this category, then you can probably uh, understand that uh, yeah, you, you, your problem is not in your collection, but in your query or vice versa. Great, thank you for those insights. And how do you think, what are the uh, biggest challenges uh, with semantic search right now? What are we going to, to tackle in the nearest future? Yeah, <laughs> okay, I can start. So from my, from my perspective, uh, the biggest challenge is scaling. Uh, like, uh, um, as, I, as I already mentioned, that uh, current limitation is uh, is memory, and memory is expensive. And if we find uh, a way how to store and serve uh, really huge collections uh, fast uh, and cheap, then uh, it could be a breakthrough in this kind of applications. If uh, if we were able to serve the same amount of data, uh, Elasticsearch can serve with the same uh, machines. Then yeah, we, we could build much more with with vector search. Yeah, from from a modeling perspective, first challenge is like new words tokens like new companies, new products, new software frameworks. So, so if the model has not seen the word, I don't know, TensorFlow or PyTorch or Qdrent, it doesn't know what it means and can present like good representation of that. So we need some good data efficient way to update the model and say, hey, here's a new company, new product name, new Netflix show uh, that went viral to say, okay, that's that's the new meaning of it, and now you, you have to update your vector space. And second big challenge is um, documents that have like multiple meanings. So, so far, vector search works nicely if the text you give in is really on a single topic. So it contains one single factual element. 
but it performs really poorly as soon as you have like multiple facts in it. For example, in e-commerce, let's say you, you sell jeans and the jeans come in different colors and different sizes. If you encode this to, to like a single vector and say, okay, the jeans is available in green and yellow and red, it doesn't know where should I put it in the vector space? Should I put it like to the green jeans or the red jeans, blue jeans? So you get like really garbage vectors out. And there's like the big question, okay, how can I encode it and say, okay, this jeans available in five different colors, available in 10 different sizes. And if I search for green jeans, it will match. If I search for blue jeans, it will match. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like a big question in terms of modeling, how to represent it. One interesting approach is the multi-vector approach where you encode inputs to, to many vectors. But as you said, scaling is a challenge. So, so if you take a vector or document and represent it as 100 vectors, uh, it puts like 100 times the load on the vector database. And if you need to keep everything in memory, it makes can make your, your solution quite expensive really quickly. So, so there is like a nice, going forward, nice uh, effort in terms of modeling and nice effort in terms of vector database. Uh, do, do you think uh, multi-vector approach could benefit from also step-by-step uh, -step querying where, for example, you you start with some uh, some request and based on the search results, you specify um, your, your query with a bit more context uh, uh, to maybe uh, um, fi find different kind of results. For example, if you if you just search for genes, it will show you all kind of the genes. And then if you click on uh, green genes, it will understand that you are actually looking for uh, color green, and you are not interested in in, in genes themselves, but rather the clothes which are uh, which have similar similar pattern or similar color. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, interesting areas in this direction is like personalized search, like how can you personalize it on your persona so that when I search for genes, I want to have like genes for men and not genes for kids or women. Um, and then you can also personalize it on a ses session basis. Like, okay, now I search for, I don't know, genes I can wear in summer, so they should be short and, and nice in, in terms of the material. So how can you quickly learn this from the modeling side? Um, the other aspect, which which is kind of interesting, is this conversational search. Like like I start and say to the e-commerce store, hey, show me jeans, and then say, hey, here are jeans, and then I can write now only green jeans, and then it shows me green jeans, and then I say, okay, looking for jeans for my son, so only show me jeans for four-year-old son. Um, how can you refine this from the modern perspective? Yeah, especially um, it's interesting if you do not have this uh, parameters pre encoded into your collection. Because if you if you have, you just can apply filters and everything works out of the box. But if you don't have, model should kind of understand what parameter is the most relevant for you in, in the cost context of your session search maybe based on uh, the sequence of que queries or um, based on your uh, behavioral patterns somehow. Agree that that's what we see in e-commerce stores. We have like this massive long list of filters in the sidebar, like size, color, <laughs> brand, um, and you never find the relevant filter. And, and um, data is also dirty, so it might, it, it's very hard to label those things, and uh, it, it yeah. tends to be uh, more desynchronized with this time. So. Agree. And then, yeah, also the labels and filters are different for categories. So if I search for genes, I need like different filters than when I search for like a disk, like a hard drive, or if I search for like a book. So, so yeah, companies put like a lot of effort designing these sidebars and labels and annotate. So if you think about Amazon, spend massive amount on like labeling and provide like all these labels, like, I don't know, you buy a notebook, what's the screen size, how much RAM, GPU power, CPU power, how much disk, and then also spend a lot of 
time to engineer for every product category this sidebar. And I think, yeah, with semantic search and conversational search, you can really make a nice like search, show me smartphones. And I say, okay, only show me smartphones below six inches that has at least, I don't know, one terabyte of SSD disk and so on. So I think that's that's really the future, like different way how we do search going away from these hard filters to more like conversational, personalized uh, search experience. Great, thanks for sharing those ideas. Actually, I believe that um, you shared some some ideas for the for the projects that could be implemented during this hackathon. I'm not sure if three days are are enough to do that, but any sort of prototype would be probably uh, well rated in our final ratings. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. I think that's uh, that's the high time to uh, just go into the questions that we got uh, during our our discussion. Uh, there are already some of them in the in Twitch. Please feel free to ask some additional ones uh, if you have uh, any doubts regarding uh, multilingual semantic search. And the, the first question is actually something that you have mentioned just just a minute ago. Is it possible to create a chatbot from Quadrant or Cohere? And uh, I would even extend that question: How to incorporate semantic search into into chatbot? Should should be should it be completely relying on semantic search, or do we also need some sort of mix? Because there are also some some things like um, let's say small talk that also has to be included. I'm not sure if that's if semantic search is the best way. What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, it depends on the purpose of chatbot. If it's just a, a therapy session type of chatbot where it can uh, answer your questions and is not supposed to provide any any specific information taken from any specific database, you can just go to ChatGPT and try it there. <laughs> it can already do it pretty much. But if, if you are looking um, into uh, uh, let's say uh, chatbot which pr should provide information from some database. Uh, you you want to manage this database, update information there, and chatbot should automatically uh, update its answers uh, based on stored information. Then yeah, in this case you would you would need search, you would need uh, embeddings, you would need uh, yeah all of this together basically. Yes, so, so at Cohere, we're working on these two topics quite actively. Uh, we have a chat board, I think, in the, the Cohere Discord channel you can interact with. We're also actively working on this grounded chatbot, like like you, you bring your vector data database with, I don't know, manuals from your company that tells, OK, how do you A, B, C? And then the, the chatbot learns how to search on this. Both is sadly not yet in an open beta, so it's currently just internally available. But with some prompt engineering, uh, you can do it like like um, take take the question, ask the question, take the question, run it through like an embedding model, hit a vector database, get the response, and then post both um, your original question. Say, okay, that's my original question. This is the response from the vector database, and then you you say, okay, it's like this prompt engineering. Say, what's the answer to it? And then you look at the output of the generative model to say, okay, that's that's what the model uh, responds to the original question plus background. Great, thanks a lot. Yes, yeah, so definitely, it's possible to implement chatbot using both Cohere and Quadrant, uh, and this is like a completely new. Uh, paradigm comparing to the, if you are familiar with tools like Raza, then that's a completely different, the completely different story. Uh, but we have another question. Um, how do you guys see the feasibility of implementing vector search applied geometric deep learning? Geometric? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um. Uh, yeah, it would be great if somebody who posted that question could could just uh, simply uh, describe uh, what she or uh, he meant. Uh, but 
in the meantime, uh, it would be also good to just um, maybe I guess a short it... answer is if geometric uh, uh, deep learning can generate vectors, then yes. <laughs> if not, probably no. Yeah, I think we can we can just take take this question off, and you can al always uh, reach us dur uh, during uh, during this hackathon. We are using uh, LabLab AI Discord Discord channel to answer your questions, so that might be also a good place for some uh, for discussion. Yeah, we have uh, clarification uh, that geometric deep learning use graph neural network. Okay, I guess there is no limitation. Like uh, it's all up to the final uh, layer of the neural network. If this final layer can output uh, vectors, then yes, you can use any kind of like internals for for vector search. It's more or less black box. Yeah, what what's relevant uh, is uh, a type of loss function you 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 are using to train it. And I guess uh, it, Nils could correct me if I'm wrong, but the most used one is a triplet loss where you uh, arrange uh, your objects. So the closed objects should be uh, should have less distance than more uh, like dissimilar ones. And if if you train uh, your uh, graph uh, neural network with this objective, with this loss function, then it could be used with um, for for search of foreign bindings. Yeah, so, so graph neural networks are kind of popular in recommendation settings where you say, OK, I, I have a user. Um, the user, I don't know, interacted with some content, let's say, on Reddit, and then I try to represent the user as this with the stuff the user interacted on Reddit and to get like an embedding of the user so that I can later map like similar users. So similar users are then defined as users that interacted with similar content on Reddit, like I don't know, commented on the same threads or like the same posts mm -hmm. uh, to do like some recommendation or later do like, okay, for this user, which comments, new Reddit, subreddits, whatever do I want to represent and yeah yeah the the output is again a vector you index in vector database and then you are able to search on it find like similar users or recommend content to user but yeah how to model it and, and what's the relationship depends on your application so so you, you have to think about like in these vector spaces like okay what makes two users similar and it can be okay two users like the same shows on netflix or reddit uh, or it can be papers sires, and then you try to represent this and learn like a model on this. Great, but it sounds like definitely feasible to combine it with, combine it with vector search. So I think that answers the question. And since we do not have any other other questions on chat, uh, I will have the the final one because we are uh, we are taking part in the hackathon. Are there any applications? Uh, you are looking for or projects that you would like to see uh, that are cre that were created during this hackathon and the kind of application that you feel uh, would be interested to, to use. Yeah, uh, for, from my side, I guess uh, the most, the biggest expectation for, uh, is to find some new ways how to apply vector search. So uh, it's, uh, is is good uh, and interesting if it's uh, uh, a direct replacement for keyword search. It's extending its functionality, but if you are able to find something which is which have different interface, which uh, works uh, in a different way comparing to traditional search systems, then it would be very interesting. For example, if you if you could organize your search uh, in your in your prototype in your demo in a way that it, for example, does not require a uh, query string at all, it would be like a definitely uh, interesting thing to, to explore. Yeah, I, 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 I can echo that. Um, often you, you find people, I don't know, that, that come from 
keyword search and then it's it's kind of hard to convince them to do like semantic search like let's say you do like this e-commerce e setting and then say yeah we have like all these filters and keywords and how can we search through different fields and like do boosting and there you say yeah it's it's kind of like hard to convince where they say okay that's a tech stack you have and you're happy with it but if you're thinking about like new new settings like cross-lingual search so, so you don't know in which language is, is the information you're looking in because i don't know let's say you work in crime investigation and you need to find like evidences to bring a bad guy behind in jail behind bars and you don't know if the bad guys communicate in english or arabic or chinese or german or russian so it can be interesting to build like solution for that and say yeah that's possible with cross-lingual search or you have like completely different applications say okay we want to monitor like who's like the first mover who knows like the first about i don't know silicon valley bank and bank grant so so maybe you look in tweets and monitor it over time and say okay there there was like some early signs of someone in texas saying okay people queue in front of the bank and try to get the money out for example uh, that's like solutions new new applications new types of search that are not possible with like traditional keyword search technologies I have one anecdotal uh, example of uh, where uh, multilingual search could, could help me personally. Uh, like as, a, as an immigrant in a new country, I struggled a lot to find a good place to have a dinner because I didn't know how dishes was called in, in the new city. And uh, <laughs> this would be really helpful if I could just search for, um, for it in, in, in English at least rather than uh, trying to translate it in, in, in a local language. So that's that's from my side, like a story, cool story. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you very much. That, that was really, uh, really cool to have you both guys uh, today at our, our discussion. Uh, I hope that that uh, people were just uh, got just more excited about the hackathon and multilingual semantic search in general. Uh, well, just to sum it up, uh, if you have any questions regarding Cohere or Quadrant and uh, would like to have the answer as soon as possible, please feel free to reach us on uh, LabLab's Discord community. Both Cohere and Quadrant has uh, have their own communities as well, so we are eager to support you with implementing semantic search, not only during this hackathon, but in general. So please feel free to reach us anytime.